My name is Matthew Herter. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine, also a part of the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce Adrian Fu Berman and Sharon Bat, our two speakers today. Adrian Fu Berman is a full professor in the departments of pharmacology and physiology and family medicine at Georgetown University's Medical Center, a physician by training but an activist at heart. Uh, Adrian Q. Berman has made innumerable contributions to the ever-growing body of research about the interface between medicine and industry. She's the founding director of a group called Farmed Out, a research and education project um, that seeks to promote rational prescribing and expose the effects of pharmaceutical marketing on physician prescribing. Sharon Bach is an adjunct professor in the, in the Department of Bioethics here at Dalhousie, as well as an independent researcher and writer. One of the core organizers in the, the Canadian breast cancer patient movement, Sharon's scholarly work has become central to the study of patient advocacy organizations in Canada and beyond. Her forthcoming book, Health Advocacy Inc., published by UBC Press, and due out later this year, is highly anticipated by scholars and I hope patients alike. And so we are very fortunate to welcome Professors Fu Berman and Bat here today to present together on the topic of patient advocacy in the drug regulatory process, both in the United States and Canada. We're fortunate not only because of their collective expertise, but also because they share, on the one hand, a deep commitment to patient engagement in healthcare, but on the other, worry greatly over how that engagement can be shaped and controlled by other interests. It's fitting on this perhaps very dark day when the tension between democratic participation and grassroots manipulation is perhaps foremost in most of our minds that Professors Few Berman and Bat are here to reveal and contest that same imbalance in the healthcare setting. So without further ado, I'll welcome our speakers to the stage. I do want to be on. Thank you. We're really excited to be here today. And um, this is actually the first time that we've ever talked um, about this, this particular subject. And it's the first time we've presented together. Um, so we're, we're really thrilled about this. So um, as, as Matt pointed out, I, I direct a project called Farmed Out. And we look at pharmaceutical company and medical device company promotion. And we're not really focusing on the overt kinds of promotion. So drug advertising, drug reps, you know, at some level doctors do know that drug reps are actually there to sell drugs. Um, there are important methods of promotion, but they're not really what we focus on. Speak, we're more interested in covert kinds of promotion. So that includes ghost written and ghost managed articles in the medical literature and um, also in consumer literature. It includes continuing medical education, uh, most of which is actually funded by industry, patient education, but also the funding of professional and patient organizations or the use of third parties as mouthpieces for marketing. Not, not exactly messages. mouthpieces, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we decided we had to stand up here together because as we were going through this, we just kept arguing with each other. So we thought we'd just <laughs> argue in front of you. We'll, we'll, t we'll talk about the tension over the terms like mouthpieces. Because <laughs> there is some. Yeah. Um, OK, so in, yeah, I don't know how familiar people are, probably varies with, with the whole drug approval process, but um, in, in Canada and the US, we have a similar process for approving a drug. I mean, drugs are highly uh, regulated um, commodities. Um, so in, the FDA has really taken the lead in, in setting out uh, the, the process that drugs have to go through, um, and that the, the idea is you want the drug to be both safe and effective before it goes to market and gets uh, promoted to physicians who are the prescribers. Uh, so in, in Canada, it's, uh, it's a division of Health Canada that, that does this approval process. In the United States, it's the FDA. Um, and uh, so this is a very important process. It's evolved over time in, in interesting ways. Um, um, a lot of people believe it's, it's become uh, less rigorous in the last 15, 20 years. Um, others would dispute that. But um, another 
responsibility that the FDA and Health Canada have is they regulate advertising and promotion, promotion to healthcare providers and consumers because, uh, again, there's concern that there might be um, um, distorted um, presentations of, of what these drugs can and can't do. And, and just to point out that drugs aren't just approved for anything. So um, although it is legal in both countries and in most countries um, for um, healthcare providers, for prescribers to use a drug for anything that they want to use it for, it is illegal for a company to promote a drug for something that it has not been approved by the health regulatory agency for. So drugs are approved for specific conditions, but after they're approved, providers can use them for anything. So we both go back to the, 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 the days of the 70s and 80s when, when women's health activists were, became very concerned about, um, about the way medicine was treating um, women's health. And, and so there, there was, in both countries, a very vibrant um, women's health movement that contested a lot of the ideas about women's bodies and, and the kinds of treatments women uh, women should have um, for a whole variety of conditions. And um, so there, there's an interesting um, lack of continuity or, or um, over time that, that we want to bring out. Um. Yeah. And, and a lot of, so we, 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 we were both involved in health advocacy um, in, in the 70s and there was, there, there was huge amounts of activity in, in both countries. And there was a lot, of, uh, there was a lot of, of women's health activism around unnecessary use of drugs, unnecessary use of medical procedures. There being too many C-sections. Were episiotomies necessary? Did women have to be knocked out um, for childbirth? Um, access to birth control, which um, was, was illegal in Canada at the time that McGill medical students, um, Donna Cherniak and uh, her boyfriend at the time, his name I don't remember. And there were others. I mean, it was, it was a whole collective at, yeah. the, at McGill, the at McGill the, Student Society. And, and so at a time when birth control was illegal in, in Canada, they put out this birth control handbook that not only had huge, um, it had great information about birth control, but also put it into a political context. Uh, it was so popular, and by the way, um, medical students at other schools actually contributed to producing, um, to producing and um, funding the distribution um, of this handbook. And it was, I gave it out at free clinics in the 1970s in the U.S. It was popular in both, in both countries. They distributed three million copies of this. That was really, um, that was really amazing. There was a lot of critical analysis um, about problems with the birth control pill, um, Barbara Seaman, um, Our Bodies Ourselves, uh, you know, still being published today, but the original, the, uh, the, the original copy was cost 40, um, 40 cents. Um, there were um, publications as well. Um, the, um, Health Sharing was a fabulous um, a Canadian publication um, on, on, um, on women's health. There was um, a, a Friend Indeed um, with Janine um, O'Leary Cobb that was for menopausal women, also um, a Canadian publication. Um, branching out was a feminist publication. Sharon was the editor of that. <laughs> um, so there were there there was a real there was a, a real vibrant um, uh, movement and a lot of examination of existing practices and a lot of efforts towards protecting women from unsafe drugs and unsafe devices and unsafe medical practices that were accepted at the time. There was also really a call for evidence. Where was the evidence that um, episiotomies actually eased birth, for example? So there were a lot of, a lot of calls for evidence as well. Yeah. Yeah, oh. so, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. And just, I, I, I'm not sure everybody knows the, the sort of story of DES, but um, in, um, in the 1970s, there was a, a physician who noticed that he had seen several cases of a very rare cancer called vaginal clear cell adenocarcinoma. It's such a, um, it's such a rare cancer, it occurs in one in a million cancers that an oncologist could go their whole professional <coughs> life and never see one. He had seen, I think, three, and wrote this up in a medical journal. And that started this sort of epidemiologic detective story that found out that the reason that these women had this cancer is because their mothers were exposed to diethylstilbestrol, a very strong estrogen, DES, um, during pregnancy. So that the women who, who developed uh, vaginal clear cell adenocarcinoma in their, their 20s had been exposed as fetuses to um, this estrogen that caused this. It also caused reproductive tract abnormalities in both 
um, in both men and um, women. And this drug was given to women during pregnancy in an effort to prevent miscarriages. It didn't work, by the way. There was never any evidence that it worked. So it was basically all harm and no benefit. And it was also <laughs> advertised as promoting healthier babies, you know, big, Bigger. healthy babies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so, so the group DES Action, it was, it was actually became a network. There, were, there were, was DES Action Canada, DES in the United States, there were some European DES Action groups. And they were basically um, patients and, and mothers and friends of family members who became very conversant with and quite angry about the promotional um, strategies of drug companies. Um, and this was sort of their case example of how harmful these um, these drugs could actually be, and and they were fighting to get um, you know, compensation and recognition and, and raise doctors' awareness so that they would understand what to do when when a patient came in who, whose mother had had been given this drug and you know, the the drug company. Well, I don't know. The, the rec a lot of the records were destroyed, so it, it was it's really a very interesting story. But <laughs> it, it it raised a lot of awareness about drugs and um, women's health. <laughs> and drug companies. <laughs> so then in the, in the 80s, there was a bit of a turn here. The, the HIV AIDS groups were um, in, in um, large part men, well-educated, um, young in many cases. Um, they wanted drugs. I mean, they, they had a life-threatening disease. It was horrible. and. So they uh, were very strong advocates and developed their own kind of uh, very in-your-face kind of um, advocacy, um, you know, actions. Um, but they were taking a different tack than than the women's health activists had, in that they they really wanted to um, see some kind of drug developed that would um, you know keep them from dying, and. Um, and they and they they worked with the companies. They they saw the need to work with the companies. They were also with drug companies. Yeah, with drug companies. They were also critical of the companies. They were very critical of the FDA, which they felt was was standing in the way of rapid drug development. So they 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 had an interesting um, influence in raising the the, the the sort of profile of patient advocates and the role of patient advocates, um, but. Um, with more of a turn to wanting drugs, new drugs developed, and um, wanting faster approvals of drugs. So very different focus from the women's health movement. So just some, some of the groups ACT UP and Gay Men's Health um, Crisis that did a lot of work in this And they're quite area. similar. In Canada and the US, the movements were quite similar. So this is... Meanwhile, uh, back in the women's <laughs> health movement. <laughs> yeah. This is a quote from a, a very uh, you know, active, she's still very active, a Canadian women's health um, uh, advocate um, who talks, I, I interviewed her for my book, and she, she talks about how um, you would ne never consider, uh, if you were involved with a group like DES Action, taking money from a drug company. Um, I mean, it would, just, it would just be unheard of, unthinkable. And, and, and so there was some awareness in the, in the 80s with the, the, the AIDS movement, and um, there, was, there were some uh, fertility groups in the women's um, health movement around the same time that were, being, that were working with the drug companies and, and accepting money from the drug companies. And so there was a tension there about the, the whole issue of drug company funding. <laughs> So with, within the grassroots groups. So most of the women's health organizations were not taking pharma money. They considered pharmaceutical companies to be the enemy, but a, a few did start taking some money and their materials got a lot glossier, better produced. <laughs> yeah, so what I've looked at in detail is the a, is a breast cancer movement, which grew out of this sort of ferment um, with HIV AIDS, and, and, but also had some continuity with the, the women's health movement. So it was kind of a mixed bag of you know, fairly um, 
a lot of, of fairly young women um, being diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, baby boomers who, you know, picked up on the idea that, you know, we needed to um, raise awareness of the disease and um, get better treatments and, and teach doctors to um, understand how to talk to us. I mean, I was one of these women, so um, I can speak in the, in the we. Um, and um, so, so the, so the aggressive breast cancer movement grew in the United States and Canada that had some elements of the AIDS activism and some elements of the women's health movement. Um, and there was also on the government side, partly because of the work of the, the AIDS activists, but uh, also a, a sort of a political um, turn that um, it was important to talk to patients that um, this was both a democratic principle and it would be good for science to hear what patients were experiencing and what their needs were. Yeah, and to incorporate patient perspectives into the design of clinical trials and into um, policies. So that was really happening in, 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 in both countries, that right. patients, that there was sort of more, more power to these, these patient advocacy groups. Right. So in Canada, we have had this tradition starting in the 60s, 70s, and, and I wish um, Dr. Paul Pross was here because he's done a lot of the work um, on, on this, uh, this whole, uh, the Canadian experience of, of government funding <coughs> advocacy and civil society groups on the basis that it was important for um, the government to understand what um, these different segments of population that were agitated about something, what they wanted, and incorporate their views into policy. So we have this tradition that goes back to the 60s, 70s, of funding advocacy groups to do, actually, to do advocacy, to do research, to educate the, um, the, 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 the communities, and also to, to educate um, policymakers. Um, so when the women's health, uh, the breast cancer movement started in Canada, this tradition was still uh, active, and Health Canada um, provided funding um, to these new groups that were, were forming, um, but also seeded uh, money to create a network across the country, which if you look at this diagram, it's kind of bureaucratic. It's not really what a grassroots um, uh, movement would look like. Um, but it was useful in that it, it, it um, gave the, the group some money to um, you know, get offices and, and um, uh, do the kind of work that they wanted to do um, so that they weren't just working on these shoestring budgets. I remember being completely shocked when I heard that the Canadian government actually funded advocacy groups to be, be, to be critical and actually give them critical feedback. Like that would never, ever happen in the United States. That's a really interesting <laughs> difference between them. But the American groups would get more money from foundations. We don't mm -hmm. have the same foundation tradition here. So then in the mid-90s, um, having set up this um, elaborate system of, of patient groups, um, many of you will remember, some of you will remember that the, the 96 budget that um, was a, a kind of a slash and burn budget. And the groups were told, okay, you're going to have to fund, you're going to have to support yourselves. We're, we're going to phase out your funding and um, you're going to be on your own. At the same time, the drug companies were noticing that, you know, these groups were, were kind of, you know, they were out there, they were interesting, <coughs> and they would make overtures, they would come to the, you know, the public displays that the groups are setting up at, at, at conferences and so on, and say, you know, we, we, we could help you. Um, you know, we hear you're doing a, you know, a big launch uh, of your new office, you know, maybe we could give you a bit of money. Um, so this interaction began between the groups and the, and the companies. Well, really, it's that they noticed they were being influential. There were now like patient <laughs> representatives on government committees in both the U.S. And, and Canada. They were getting power. That's what they noticed. <laughs> well, well I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I, mean, I think that came a little later, as I, as I will explain. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So pharma became an important source of fun, funding in both the U.S. and, yeah, and Canada. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so what, I, what I was getting at, my <laughs> disagreement is that um, I read a lot of the literature that the, the, the drug companies developed in this period 
let's say from in the late 90s into the early 2000s, there were quite a few articles about um, in the drug marketing literature saying things like, you know, um, we've been following this strategy of just spray and pray, like just throw the money out there and um, you know, just give it to whatever group wants money. And these were fairly small amounts of money typically, um, maybe $5,000, $10,000 or $1,000 to print your newsletter and just hope that it does some good and that it will make our, our company look, um, it'll be good public relations. But they weren't systematically uh, cultivating uh, relationships and um, expecting anything particular in return other than just good, good feelings. Um, so that was a spray and pray. But then if you look at the literature, that, that there's, a, there's a, uh, a turn around 2000, 2001, 2002, um, where articles start appearing and books start appearing saying, you know, this is, we should be doing this more systematically. So this is the company in North Carolina that puts out these books for pharmaceutical companies. Oh, and, uh, a, and a, any vendor for pharmaceutical companies, you always have to add like a couple of zeros to how much money it costs. <laughs> if you're selling a 60-page book to a pharmaceutical company, you can charge $4,950. <laughs> yeah, so this, this, is, this is just an example of the kinds of uh, documents and, and that, that started to come out that um, really explained that you know not all these groups were the same you know some of them are more important than others some of them were, were critical of drug companies some of them really like drug companies you have to understand the community you have to work carefully so that you know that that your efforts don't backfire and um, and that you you have this effective relationship that both sides feel is 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 useful productive essentially how to manipulate them <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> okay, um, we'll get to that again. So out of this, in, this interaction in this sort of new way of dealing with the groups or, or working with the groups, uh, there, came to an under, there came to be this understanding that again, you see it in the, in the promotional literature, the advertising literature, and also from the groups themselves, they'll say, what we have in common, what the groups have in common with the companies is we want uh, rapid access to new treatments and we want those treatments on the formularies. And that's good for the drug companies and it's good for the patients. I mean, that was the discourse that became widespread throughout the, the patient advocacy community. And this is just an example of, of one particular advocate who did a, a, she did a master's thesis on the whole phenomenon of, um, of drug company funding, it, which she was very much in favor of. So, so this is the rationale for, yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's a recent article that some of you may have read. We distributed it to, to, to Sheila for people who are particularly interested. This has just come out. It's by, what's her first name? Um, um, Barbara. Bar Barbara von Tigerstrom, who's in Saskatchewan, a lawyer. <coughs> Um, and she describes the way the groups have been working primarily in um, the United States and Europe where the, the process of, of regula regulators working with patient groups has become much more developed and, and um, it's, they've really tried to work, at, at, uh, work out a way of, of making it productive. But she says, um, it's not that the drug companies are telling the patient groups what to say, mm -hmm. and, and, and in my interviews with patient, patients who were taking money from drug companies, they always said, they don't tell us what to say. Um, and that's true. Yeah, by and large it's true. It might mm -hmm. not always be true. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so, so in her analysis, she says, is this, what seems to happen is more uh, what's been called deep capture, so that um, you get, this is a sort of a synergy going on where um, the groups and the, and the, um, the funders um, just start to think the same way and they kind of, you know, that their beliefs and perceptions uh, become aligned. And it's quite subtle. It's not, uh, it's not a matter of the drug companies saying, we're going to give you money and we want you to, to do this. It's, 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 that's not the way it really works. Yeah, and I'm just thinking. Uh, I'm just thinking of an example, um, for example, where where a drug company um, 
uh, met with a um, with a black women's health group and the idea was to identify the problems um, in that community, what were the most important health um, problems. But the meeting essentially led the group to, de to decide that chronic kidney disease was the biggest health problem facing the black community at that time. They had not come in believing that. Um, but that was a decision that was essentially, that, that is what this company that um, convened the, the meeting wanted them to come out with, and they, they sort of manipulated the meeting in such a way that um, they got the okay of, of, of the women on the result that they wanted. So that, that they set the agenda. They set the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Limit the topics and yeah. And, and so, I mean, regulatory capture is when, you know, a government agency is, essentially, is being so influenced by an outside force, usually a corporation, that they sort of lose their ability to independently, uh, you know, function. So this is another, this is a, sort of a different form where you're actually going several levels down into the, in, in, into the actual groups themselves. So an example of, of what I would call a deep, um, deep capture is um, something I looked at. In, it was an, an advocacy campaign I looked at in my research. Um, it, it has several steps. So the drug company GSK gave some money to a, a, a national breast cancer group in uh, 2008, I think it was, and it was, it was to do a report on wait times uh, within uh, for for breast cancer patients, so wait times, as we know, it's a big issue in Canada that that patients stress out about. Um, so the, this report looked across the country, different provinces, uh, how long uh, patients breast cancer patients waited for their surgery, how long they waited for um, uh, radiation, and then looked at how long they waited for um, uh, drugs. And the way it was framed in the report was. Um, how long you wait for a new breast cancer drug starts at the point where the drug company makes a submission to Health Canada. And then, um, and then from that time to approval is your, your, the patient's wait time, which is not normally the way we, we think of these things, but that's what, what says in, it says in this booklet. They redefined wait times. <laughs> and then again, there's another wait time when the drug is approved by Health Canada while the province is, is trying to decide whether or not to put it on the formulary. So that's another thing that takes time. Um, so there's no drug, no specific drug mentioned in this, in this booklet, but there is a reference to these new um, exciting drugs that are being developed for breast cancer patients. Um, um, particularly with advanced, I think it's particularly with advanced disease, but it's, um, um, anyway, so, so this book that comes out, there's quite a, you know, gets quite a bit of press attention. Um, then in December 2009, there's this front page story in the, the Globe and Mail about a woman who is, has advanced cancer, it's advancing very quickly, her oncologist says, you know, there's really no drug out there for this woman except for this new drug combination, um, Explodive plus Tycurb. Um, and Tycurb happens to be a new drug that was developed by GSK um, that funded the Wait Times report. Um, but this woman can't get access to the drug because the Ontario uh, committee that decides on drug approvals has not approved payment for the drug. Um, so there's a big hoo-ha. Um, this is like this story comes out in the Globe and Mail a week before Christmas, and the the the, the group that got the money to do the wait times report says, "Whoa, you know, this is this this person is having to wait unreasonably long for this drug to be approved," and does a um, <coughs> they write letters to the committee that's um, to that makes the decisions about the formularies, and they send a notice out to all their members saying, you know, this is a really important case and, and you know, please write letters. And by the end of December, the, the, the formulary committee had approved the drug. So it's... In days. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of an example. I mean, there are variations on this that I've seen play out um, in different provinces with different drugs. 
um, it, it's hard to say, well, you know, because the drug company funded the group, that's why they did it. But there, there's some, something, there's a dynamic there that's quite interesting. And, and the woman in the story had metastatic um, uh, breast cancer. I mean, at that time, there were no cures for metastatic breast cancer. We still don't have cures for metastatic breast cancer. But the, yeah, and, and in the, the, the messages that the group, that the breast cancer group sent out, they talked about how this was a, you know, a poten potentially life-saving drug, mm -hmm. which a drug company wouldn't say that because, you know, they're more they're, careful. They're not allowed. <laughs> so in the, in the U.S. Um, uh, last year, for controversial uh, drugs, uh, the FDA will sometimes hold advisory committee meetings. They're not, um, they, they are not bound to follow the advice of their independent advisory committees, but they almost always do, probably about 95, 97% of the time, they follow the advice of an advisory committee meeting. So there is a drug called a Teplersin or a Sarepta. Um, that was used for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a genetic disease um, it only affects boys. Uh, most of them die by, um, they die very young by the time they're 20. It's very sad. And this company developed um, a drug. They tested it in about a dozen uh, kids. It was um, a poorly designed clinical trial that doesn't really uh, fit the, it's just not a reliable clinical trial, and it didn't even work within this really bad clinical trial that they did. Um, however, the drug went to an advisory committee meeting. The hearing room was packed with hundreds of families of children with Duchenne's and the families of children with Duchenne. Um, the, the, um, they, they look a, l a little similar because they're all on steroids and ha so have the sort of moon face that you get uh, w uh, with steroids. And the, the, these, these were um, children and their families who got up to the microphone and said, said things like, please don't let me die. Please approve this drug. Um, the advisory committee was torn. They did vote against approving the drug, but it was, a, it was really a split vote. And the FDA overruling both its medical officers, the medical officers who assess the drug said, this drug doesn't work. <laughs> it should not be approved. The advisory committee narrowly voted against approving the drug. Um, and the higher ups at FDA overruled both of these and approved this drug, a point at which I think ended effective drug regulation in the US. Um, and so besides um, giving money to, and in, in some cases creating, uh, patient advocacy groups, pharmaceutical companies also invent diseases um, and, or, and conditions. And so one, one of these that, that, um, that was invented by drug companies is female, um, female sexual dysfunction. And then later, sort of the daughter of FSD was hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Um, and uh, that was actually, it was developed in order to sell a testosterone patch that ultimately failed in approval in the U.S. And I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think it was ever approved in Canada um, either. Um, and there is, there is this, this, this wonderful book by um, a Canadian, Australian, and um, American researcher um, uh, that sort of spells out the whole, uh, the, the whole story of, of sexual dysfunction drugs in women. Um, but here's, here is the definition of this invented disease, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, characterized by persistently or recurrently deficient sexual fantasies and desire for sexual activity that causes market distress or interpersonal difficulty. Can you note that last? So even if the woman is not actually bothered by her low libido, if her partner is bothered by the low libido, she gets to be diagnosed with a disease. Um, and this came along with some patient tests. This is my favorite one uh, that doctors could give to patients. The um, female sexual function index is my favorite question, which asks, how often do you feel sexual desire or interest? This is on a five-point scale. Okay, if you respond that you feel sexual desire 50% of your waking hours, you only <laughs> score a three. In order to score a five, you have to say that you feel sexual desire all or almost all of your waking hours. <laughs> Something I think is pretty inconsistent with, say, having a job or <laughs> going to school, just saying. <laughs> 
So fulbanzarin is actually a failed antidepressant. It was tested as an antidepressant. It didn't work. But a few people in the trial said, it must have said things to the researchers that made them think that, oh, you know, maybe this drug actually, um, actually boosts libido. So they then developed the drug as a libido boosting drug for this imaginary condition, um, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. They brought it to the FDA and the FDA rejected it on safety reasons. So then the company that developed it, Beringer um, Ingelheim, they, they dropped the drug. They, they just dropped it. I find the safety reasons, they're, they're interesting. Sorry, or, oh, what the safety reasons are? Um, sudden fainting, <laughs> <laughs> excessive sedation, um, which actually might be part of the reason the drug has an effect. It's been shown that getting an hour's more sleep a night really helps your sex life. Just free tips. Um, <laughs> um, so so, so Berlinger and Gelheim dropped the drug. It was picked up by this tiny husband and wife team uh, pharmaceutical company called Sprout Pharmaceuticals. They brought it to the FDA again, and the FDA rejected it again. You know, similar, similar reasons. So they created this fake consumer campaign, which I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about, and brought it to, uh, brought it to the FDA again. Um, and this was a really clever uh, marketing thing. One of the founders of Sprout Pharmaceuticals was a former drug rep. Um, wait, I think I have pictures of, yes, this is, this is her, Cindy Whitehead. Um, and they, they, they had their signature color, uh, uh, pink, and they developed this campaign called Even the Score. And they actually hired a, a well-known feminist to go to women's groups, mainly women's groups that were actually clueless about FDA uh, uh, drug regulation, and to convince them that there were 26 drugs that were um, approved for uh, male sexual dysfunction and there were zero for women, and this was an unfair feminist issue. We needed to even the score, 26 to zero. That was their, <coughs> that was their call. And now, in fact, there has never been any drug approved to increase male libido, and there's been, but at this time, there was never any drug that was approved uh, uh, to treat female libido. There were some drugs, there are drugs like Viagra, for example, that were helpful for sexual dysfunction and actually work. Um, but you can, there are also drugs that um, are approved for sexual dysfunction um, in uh, women, and there's also non-drugs like uh, lubricant, uh, for example, um, that can be effective for, for certain kinds of sexual problems. Um, so it was never true <laughs> that the score was 26 to zero, but they created this incredible media campaign and they actually had some women's groups like the National Organization for Women, which doesn't usually do health work and doesn't know anything about <laughs> <laughs> drug regulate, about the FDA, um, to, support, to support them um, on this. They got senators to write letters, et cetera. And they, they brought this drug to an, FD, you know, to an FDA advisory committee and the third time it was, actually, um, it was actually approved, despite the fact that this drug causes sudden prolonged inner unconsciousness requiring medical intervention, blood pressure drops of about 40 points, um, uh, excessive sedation. You can't ever have alcohol when you are taking this drug, and of course alcohol and sex have nothing to do with each other. Um, and it interacted with a lot of common migraine medications and other medications as well. In fact, um, the, the physicians who prescribe the drug have to take an educational uh, module about its dangers. Uh, pharmacists who uh, give it out also have to um, um, also have to take an educational uh, module um, about this. So this was an incredible, you know, incredible public relations campaign, and it was presented in the media because. There were a number of women's groups, women's health groups, the ones who didn't take money from Sprout Pharmaceutical or didn't take money from Pharma, who were against this drug, who testified against this drug. I've testified against this drug on, uh, you know, at the, at the FDA. So the groups that weren't taking money from Pharma were all against the drugs. <laughs> the groups that did take money from Pharma were all for the drug. And that did not come across in the media. It was like, oh, women's groups, they're in a cat fight, <laughs> as opposed to, no, follow the money. If you separate them out by the money, it's very clear that the evidence-based groups and the, the ones that did not take Pharma money were all against the drug. Um, so Farmed Out was pretty involved in this. Um, uh, they, we, they were, they, w there was a, a congressional uh, briefing where they were handing out flyers. The score is 26 to zero. We're handing out flyers saying the score is zero to zero. We even copied their font and everything. So it looked very similar. Um, and <laughs> we, we put out a lot of materials uh, educating women about the facts. And I have to say, and, and other women's health organizations, the National Women's Health Network, and other organizations were also putting out materials. And I think we were pretty effective at actually educating women. So although 
the PR campaign was millions of women are demanding these drugs and the media didn't seem to notice that the company only ever had one woman who was a paid spokesperson who was talking to reporters. It's like, where are these other millions of women? There, always, there seems to be this one woman, really. Um, anyway, uh, the drug was approved within two days of uh, its approval. Sprout um, sold the, this drug to Valiant Pharmaceuticals for $1 billion. One drug, $1 billion. Um, possibly the worst decision that Valiant made, although they kind of made a lot of bad decisions. Um, so they launched the drug in October 2015. And uh, I don't have recent numbers, but they're basically selling like a few hundred prescriptions a month um, that women have actually completely voted with their feet on, on this drug. It's a dangerous drug. It's, an, and it's also not very effective. Like I said, its main, its main effect may be just uh, getting women more, more sleep, but there's not, 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 not really good evidence that does anything for libido. Um, specifically, um, so it's really been sort of a disaster in the marketplace. But you know, lucky you, it's now under review at Health Canada. Um, so there's many there's many things besides hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Um, pharmaceutical companies have e have either invented or redefined uh, many conditions, and there's a concept in industry called condition branding, where you um, you you create a drug disease duo. You know, if you can redefine the disease, then you you don't you can if by pushing the disease, you're pushing a specific drug. So that's condition um, branding, and these are. Uh, these are some just, I, I'm not going to go over all these, but like, so for example, for a redefined um, condition, um, bipolar disorder, for example, it, that used to be when I was in medical school, bipolar disorder was when you cycled between being depressed and being manic. Well, there's not a lot of people who really have classic bipolar disorder, so it's not a big enough market for the companies. They wanted a bigger market. So they essentially um, redefined bipolar disorder to mean cycling between depression and normalcy which is what we used to call <laughs> depression, but whatever. Um, yeah, so that's, that would be an example of sort of redefining. And that, so here's an example of an invented uh, disease. We've been talking a lot about women's health, so we don't want the men to be left out. Um, you two, and by the way, just informed consent, you know, you may have walked into this room thinking you were a healthy human, but you're going to go out <laughs> with a disease. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's uh, one of the, the low T. So a low T. Uh, Testosterone was sold to consumers through low T. For physicians, you know, we don't, it's a little too informal a term, so it was called late onset hypogonadism in the way that it was sold to physicians and why you should test all your patients for uh, low T. And I've, I've written a lot on this if people are, are interested. But they had these self diagnosis things on the web. And, um, you know, they say things like, um, are you sad and or grumpy? Or <laughs> have you noticed a recent deterioration in your ability to play sports? Sometimes that's, that's, sometimes that's put as, has your sports performance um, decreased in the last five years? Which, you know, I think would probably apply to anyone over, say, I don't know, 20, 25. <laughs> <laughs> or some of them say, do you fall asleep after dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, how long after dinner? Does you know? <laughs> everyone fall asleep after dinner? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, you, do you have a lack of energy? Like, nobody actually thinks they have enough energy. So that's always, like, a really good thing to put on these, the, you know, the, these, these quizzes. Do you feel fatigued? Do you ever get headaches? You know, so these are, this is an example, like, a test that you are meant, you are meant to fail. Um, I, I have this disease, binge eating disorder. Um, so binge eating um, certainly can be a sign of uh, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, binge, binge eating can be problematic when somebody just like starts eating frozen hot dogs out of their freezer or whatever. That's definitely a problem. But is it a separate disease? Well, the company that sells Vyvanse, which is an addictive amphetamine, uh, needed a new indication after um, the, the patent started to run out on their drug for, um, for treating attention deficit disorder. So they created this disease, binge eating um, disorder. And this is defined as regularly eating far more food than most people would in a similar time period under similar circumstances. Well, I mean, just last night, I convinced <laughs> <laughs> Matt and Sharon to order all of the desserts at Elliott and Vine because I wanted to taste all of them. And you know how people, like, they're like, oh, let's order one dessert and, like, let's all share it. And I'm like, no, let's order three desserts and share them. <laughs> anyway, so, I, you know, I think I qualify. And it also has to happen more than, it has to take place at least once a week. How about three times a day? I mean, some of us just eat more than other people. That's okay. That, you know, anyway, but no, now, now I have a disease. Or um, I, I accidentally cut off the t um, top of this, but this is a disease, pseudobulbar affect. Now, this is actually 
this is a neurologic disease. Sometimes when people have a lesion in a particular part of their brain, they suddenly start laughing or crying for no reason. And it's not actually, if it's not actually connected to an emotion that they're feeling. Uh, really rare, okay? There's not a lot of people who are gonna be eligible for the drug that's been developed for uh, binge eating disorder, which by the way is really just an over-the-counter cough medicine, but whatever. Okay. It's going to be an expensive pharmaceutical. Or, you're talking about this one or the binge eating one? Is it no, no, this is the pseudobulbar affect. Okay. Yeah, I just I accidentally cut off the, okay. the heading. It says pseudobulbar affect. Okay, but here, but there is, a, there is a test on the web that you can take to see. So they wanted to expand the market. So there's a, there is a test on the web that you can take to see if you, have pseudobulbar affect. Um, others have told me that I seem to become amused very easily, or that I seem to become amused about things that really aren't funny. <laughs> I find that even when I try to control my laughter, I am often unable to do so. I'm hearing laughter. I, or I find that even when I try to control my crying, I'm often unable to do so. So uh, Sharon and I were talking this morning. We we're like, wait, isn't that kind of like the definition of laughing or crying? It's not like really, you know, <laughs> it's not really something you necessarily control. Um, there are times when I won't be thinking of anything happy or funny at all, but then I'll suddenly be overcome by funny or happy thoughts. So now we're beyond funny, right? <laughs> you ever suddenly have happy thoughts? <laughs> You might be ill. So um, I've given this test to a bunch of people. I found that almost all women fail it, um, and about 70% of men. So this is like, you know, you might need to go ask your doctor whether you have PBA for short, pseudo bulbar affect. Um, okay. Oh, right. I think you're. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, there have been a lot of surveys to see how many groups are funded by the pharmaceutical industry, and they, they tend to range from uh, maybe 30% of all patient advocacy groups to 70%. It's really hard to get an exact figure, um, but there are lots of them. Um, <laughs> now, there's, there's a, it's just a sample. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was an article that just came out in the, in the medical press a couple of days ago saying there were, what was it, 78,000, don't we have that figure? Yeah, yeah I think it's 7,600, more than 7,000, almost 8,000 groups in, just it, in the U.S. Oh, wait, patient, we patient, have patient advocacy 78, groups. 7,865. Yeah. Um, and um, widespread funding of, you know, they did a survey and they found, you know, a, lo a lot of these groups were funded by, um, by pharma companies. I mean, I would argue that it's not so important to know what proportion are funded, but which, which important groups are being funded by pharma, because not every patient advocacy group is going to have an impact on policy. Yeah, one of the big ones. Yeah, so we, we made up lists of the groups we knew of in Canada and the U.S., the, the, the patient or, or health advocacy groups that don't take pharma funding, and there are a number of groups that have taken a position that they will not take pharma funding. So these are, are uh, the ones we could think of in the United States and um, in Canada. Um, you may never have heard of these groups because they, they, um, they, they tend to work on a, you know, a lower budget. They don't, um, they don't have the same kind of profile um, they may or may not be um, consulted uh, by the, the, the FDA or, or Health Canada on issues, um, but, but the, the thing is that they get drowned out by, by these many groups now that are um, pharma funded. Um, and so the message tends to be skewed, these groups that are concerned about safety and um, messaging that is in line with the, the research. Um, you know, that, that are concerned about rapid, ac uh, rapid approvals that they may not be, um, you know, some of those drugs, a lot of those drugs are having to be withdrawn, the ones that are, are approved very quickly because there's supposedly a great need for them. Um, it turns out they have safety issues that um, are not immediately apparent. Um, so you don't hear that, that line very often from patient groups. Yeah, and I want to say, so like these, the, these are just samples of the 7,865 7, uh, groups in the U.S. that does, you know, not counting Canada. These are all the groups that we think exist, okay? <laughs> so we're talking 7,685 to eight. And like maybe we missed one, but we've, this isn't just what we came out of our head. We've actually like asked other people, do you know of any other groups? And this is all anyone can come up with. So maybe we've missed one or two, but we're talking under 10 in each country. And as Jared said, not, not necessarily that popular. 
So there has been a, there's been a fair bit of debate within the groups about uh, pharma funding, whether it's, it's uh, beneficial to patients or not. This was a, 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 a good pairing of two articles that was published in the BMJ in 2007. Um, and it you know, brings out the arguments that, that groups on both sides make um, quite if effectively. Um, and this is, uh, the BMJ has been very good in following um, conflict of interest issues. Although I, I would say, I mean, this was a, a cover story that they ran a couple of years ago about uh, patient groups um, and the fact that it's often not apparent whether a, a group is, is, is taking pharma money or not. So there is a transparency issue. We think the transparency issue has been overplayed, um, but that was, a, that was a theme in this article. Um, because Carl, Carl, <laughs> yes, as, 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 as Carl Elliott likes to say, um, you know, if you're married and you're having an affair, does it solve the problem to come home and say to your partner, "Honey, I'm having an affair"? You know, that's disclosure. <laughs> Transparency. <laughs> Transparency. Does it solve the problem? <laughs> um, so you know, we we think you have to go further um, to. Uh, once you have the transparency, which is essential, it's, it's, um, it's necessary, uh, then you have to look to see whether there's a, a, an effect, um, yeah. what the effects are. Transparency is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, so, yeah, so it, Canada has, has done some sort of sporadic, um, they've made efforts to include patient representatives in, in the drug approval process, but there's a very good article by a Saskatchewan lawyer, um, well we mentioned this before, Barbara von Tigerstrom, about how really it's, it's the United States and Europe that have, have made a systematic attempt to include patient representatives in the drug approval process. It's proven quite difficult to do, um, there are just all kinds of reasons why, it, well we've talked about some of them. Um, you know, who, who does this particular patient represent in the end? Um, you know, how typical or, or, or how representative are their concerns? Um, are they um, conflicted by conflicts of, in, you know, fu funding? Um, you know, there, there are just a lot of questions about how you go about selecting these, these patients and, mm -hmm. and what weight you put on the, the, the concerns that they raise. Um, Canada do, hasn't done this very often. There are a couple of, of efforts that they made, I think it was in 2006, with breast implants and uh, um, COX-2 inhibitors. Um, with the breast implants, there, there were, I think, seven patients that came to the public hearing. <coughs> they were asked to fill out, a, a, you know, to disclose whether or not they had um, funding from one of the breast, breast implant um, uh, companies, and I think all seven had been flown in by the companies. Um, I'm not absolutely sure. I'm trying to verify that through uh, Access to Information Act because it's, it's one of those things that got lost in history. Um, and in both, in both countries, at, at these regulatory hearings, um, uh, advocates may be asked to disclose, but they're not required. And it doesn't prevent you from testifying if you don't. So at the phlebanserin hearings, the female Viagra, uh, uh, here um, um, at the at the advisory committee, at the FDA advisory committee, everybody was asked to disclose, and this is what every person who was flown in by the company said: "I have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting," which, of course, totally <laughs> doesn't say anything about whether you were paid <laughs> to be there, right, or whether your expenses were paid to be there. So. Um, but you're not even required to say that. You are not required. You are requested politely <laughs> to disclose. So even that low level, we don't think transparency is enough, but even that low level of transparency is not required. And, and when, well, there's a group that I've been involved with, Women in Health Protection, which now been has been defunded and doesn't really exist anymore. But in, in the mid-2000s, uh, 2006 or seven, I think, we, we we raised concerns with people we were meeting with at Health Canada about the fact that there were, you know, they seemed to be consulting a lot with, with pharma funded groups and, and, and giving a lot of weight to their points of view. And they came up with this thing called the, the voluntary, 
the VSI, Voluntary Statement of Information, which is a kind of a strange term for declaring your, your um, Conflict. financial conflicts. Um, but you know, they said that um, it, it's completely voluntary whether you fill it out. Um, and if you do fill it out and say you have some conflicts, um, <coughs> that doesn't have to be disclosed. You can request that that be kept um, between you and the government. And it, it also doesn't preclude you being you know, part of the process. We want to make sure we have um, time for um, questions and answers and comments, so we're going to wrap up pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah, we think there needs to be more awareness and discussion of these issues, and it has started to hit the headlines in the, in the states, I, I think because of a, a couple of the cases that Adrian has gone over. Um, there's started to be um, news reports. Um, transparency is, is important, but, but we need to understand that it's not the answer. And there needs to be funding for groups that are not taking pharma money. Um, in Canada, we could go back to this tradition of government support. In Germany, they have a model where health insurers pay a small percentage per year per individual insured that then can go into, goes into a pot and, and health consumer groups that aren't taking money from pharma can apply for, for money from this pot. Um, or, or another idea that's been floated is you have some kind of independent body that could get money from multiple sources, whether it's government, private, uh, whatever, and then there'd be a system for applying for that money. But the, gr the groups do need money, and there is a problem with them not having, there's no real source they can go to other than pharma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Oh, so that, that's, yeah, our recommendations. One is to, to make money available, um, restrict the participation of, in decisions regarding drugs and medical devices to um, the independent groups. And if you want to testify on these committees, we think you should be, um, not be getting money from the, from the industry. And there needs to be some kind of regulation or oversight because based, the way it is now, I mean, patient groups can make these claims like, you know, such and such a drug is potentially life-saving when it's pretty clear that it's not. Um, and there's nobody monitoring that. And, and then these quotes can end up in the media and it kind of disseminates this um, misunderstanding, which, you know, again, the drug companies can't make those kinds of re remarks. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, it seems to me there's a need for some kind of, um, I don't know how you would put it in place, but maybe the lawyers in the, in the room could um, suggest what, what might work. And I, I just wanted to mention that um, Farm Data is holding a, um, a conference at Georgetown in June. I'd like to in, invite all of you to. And um, it's, uh, I think it's $25 for students, and it's more for uh, non-students. <coughs> um, but we're, we're going to actually be doing a lot on this subject of consumer advocacy groups. And, um, and Sharon's going to be one of our speakers. Um, it, we're, we're doing a lot on drug costs. We're doing a lot on, uh, we're doing things on opioids. Um, it, it's going to be really great. It's a really fun conference, so I just wanted to invite you. And also, um, I just wanted to mention Sharon's book that um, will be coming out soon, at least if she ever finishes writing it. <laughs> well, no, actually, that's not. I shouldn't. That's a little unfair. It's going through very extensive legal vetting, <laughs> so she is having to rewrite uh, a lot. So even though she's way more moderate than um, I am, apparently she's not quite moderate enough for the lawyers. So um, as soon as that process is finished, it's 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 going to be really great. Yeah, so. and and yeah, I have some forms. If people want to order it in the next ten days, you can get twenty percent off. <laughs> but it's not coming out till July. So. Um, so I think we're going to end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, comments? <laughs> I really enjoyed that. And, and, and I'm very happy you mentioned Valiant Pharmaceuticals because they're like, it's like a clown show. And, <laughs> no, they published, the, you know, the Pearson, the guy who uh, was CEO of it, and they made 128 million last year while the stock is tanking and they buy bad drugs. And this is what we call the pharmaceutical industry in Canada. They are, you know, they're the biggest dog in the earth, essentially. And they're basically holding up their dirty laundry, I mean, just in a tiny way. Um, and I was, I just, apropos of nothing else, I was doing other research this week, and I went down my old, I found Harry Frankfurt. I don't know if that name is 
being very useful to you, but he's professor emeritus of philosophy at Princeton right now, and he's still doing well. And his seminal paper is just called On Bullshit. <laughs> and he brought the word bullshit into public discourse, because basically that's what you've been talking about all morning is bullshit. Now, I, because it's an academic word now, I can say it. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was and, and I have to preface it by saying, look, it's academically accepted. It's the highest IED level you can find. Um, but, and you're talking about fake news, and I understand our American cousin to the South are uh, changing their government this morning or something like that. And, yeah, don't, don't so remind me. This, this <laughs> fake news, uh, you're talking about the far version of fake news, which the Russians used in the Crimea to say, geez, look at all the less Russian citizens here and stuff. You know what I mean? It, it's just a general vibe of fake news coming from huge piles of money somewhere. The clouds where, where those people sit on top of those things. So I just like to thank you for a very entertaining presentation. Oh thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Um, so I'm a social worker and I worked for ten years as a drug access navigator. So I worked at the Cancer Center at the Road, helping patients coordinate funding for very expensive treatments, sometimes in the market. Um, always post approval. I was at the intersection between pharma, patients, patient groups, funders, as was insurance firm. Um, and it, it's a little bit different in Canada. I had an interesting window on all of this that you're talking about. And it is a little deeper than just bad pharma, vulnerable patient groups. Um, there is patient input in Canada. I've had it where the people right. that recommend to funders whether they should fund a drug or not, do have a formal process that patient groups go through, both to say whether a drug should be funded, but what is the value of this drug to them? What are the side effects they should be looking at? And what is the problem of life issues they should be looking at? And that is terribly scrutinized. But there, my worry is with the expansion of the CADET process for patient group input, what that might mean for some of this deep capture mm -hmm. type of approach. Because the way I see it happen now is not so much a, here's something, we have some funding for you. If you have a need, let us know. That does happen. You mean with the? With the drug companies. The drug companies, the okay. Patients. And in that, building a relationship. Yeah. Where the, it's not so much the benefits of the drug, it's the positive brand of the company. Yeah. The caring company, the company that will and many people do care in the industry. They do yeah. want to see right. No, for sure. But the overall driver's profit and the way it is framed is around the, the brand and that relationship. So it, but I also see from the patient group side, we right now live in a society that's based on demand. Um, patients want drugs and they want them now. As soon as those drugs are approved, they want access to them, but we have longer and longer delays to when funders actually will fund them. So the pressure actually is not in the approval stage as much. Yeah. Approval actually happens for <coughs> and that takes a while, one to two years, but it happens. It's the approval of funding piece where I see a lot of that pressure being put forward. They don't really have a question, it's more of a comment that I think we can easily get into the either or, one's bad, the other's not type of approach. But really, I've seen patient groups approach pharma and say, We'll go to bat for your product if you help us. You know, we have a need. Have you seen them say, your drug is too expensive, why don't you bring down the cost and maybe it'll go more quickly under the formulary? Uh, yeah, and that's a whole other process. <coughs> that's more their lecture. Yeah. But yeah, there's the, there's the, but really a lot of this is based, by the way I see it, is this is very much fueled by our society today that wants wants a quick fix, wants an answer, wants that next best thing, and it gets talked about on social media. Mm -hmm. And blown out of proportion, not always fed by the media of, from, that's coming from pharma, but sometimes the patients group themselves and people talking. Oh yeah, yeah. But, but I would argue that that, that that discourse is very much affected by pharma, and um, yeah, and that, that that, that the things that advocacy groups used to used to uh, used to demand have changed. That one of the things that pharma funding 
buys from groups is silence, and yeah. I'm quoting Sharon here, it's, it, why should I quote you? Go on about that. Oh, well, that was what I was raising with the, with the pricing. I mean, the pricing has just become a huge issue in the policy field and, and among physicians. And um, you don't hear the patient groups um, talking about it, you know, protesting it. They may be, when I interviewed people, they'd say, well, we talk about those things to the company representatives when we're meeting with them, but they don't come out publicly and say, you know, we think this drug is too expensive. Yeah, and, and it's not, and I would say not, some of them, not even you're just. You're saying some of them do? Yeah. But, it, but it's not just pricing either. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's silence on issues of other things that should be, other things that should be looked at and things in the doctor-patient relationship and things and uh, the, 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 the fact that, that drugs that are already out there or are in the process you know, might be too harmful or might not be effective enough. Like they're not, they're not holding the company's feet to the fire. Uh, and when they do, they are punished. And I know this more from the, the influencing the physician's angle than, than, um, patient, than patient advocacy groups. Um, but um, for example, I was giving a farmed out um, talk at a hospital um, in Albuquerque um, and um, it was funded, at, uh, the, the, it was a, a cardiology for primary care practitioners conference that was funded by Pfizer and I guess they hadn't known either that I was going to be speaking or what I was going to say, but I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I talked about a lot of these covert and overt um, marketing techniques and Pfizer withdrew its funding from the conference. <laughs> Um, and also, by the way, all of the drug companies that had booths packed their booths and left in response to my talk. So th this is supposed to be, that conference is supposed to be funded by an unrestricted educational grant. It's unrestricted as long as you don't say something they don't like. And that, and that's, you know, that also holds true with advocacy groups. And there is in the U.S. and Canada in terms of advertising regulations around those kind of contracts. Mm -hmm. And I'm not defending one or the other. I'm just saying there's a lot more of this conversation and, yeah. and, and, and on this issue. There's also in Canada what we're seeing now is we're seeing the creation of broader based patient organizations that aren't disease specific that talk about things like drug access. And those yeah. are, the, those are the, the organizations where I really question who's behind it. Who's like Best it. Medicines Coalition <laughs> type groups. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know, now the new fronting for RD, yeah. innovative medicine. And, but there's other organizations that are driving the access. Yeah. You 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 talking about you know, perverse incentives for pharma leading to perverse results, and then you suggest that government funding would be a solution. But doesn't government also, from time to time, act on perverse incentives? It Don't can, yeah. And that's to that's pay, to pay for cheap medicines that a lot of people need that may be worthless, and not pay for a few expensive medicines that may be valuable for someone. So how do you get around the perverse incentives regardless of yeah. the funder is? And that, that is something actually that the pharma fun, patient groups taking pharma funding will say, well, any, any source of funding is going to pr provide an well, influence. I think, I think your idea of having a group that's independent, collecting money from diverse sources and right. issue it out may be fine. But government won't participate in that in the same way that pharma won't participate. That's, well, that's where we're. Like we're have control. Yeah, that's the. Messages. Yeah, I mean, that, that's part of the point I wanted to make about how we've evolved a, a different culture within government. Now, government very much, when they give money to a group, they expect the group to be um, on side with government policy. Whereas it mm -hmm. used to be, it was viewed as helpful to government to hear critique. And that culture is gone. So I don't know whether we can recreate it. I mean, I, from time to time, Trudeau says things like, you know, it's good to have dissent. I, I mean, I, I'm hoping that he'll continue it's that. Dissent, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would also argue that it's really in government's um, business to, in interest to promote public health, and that is a different incentive than, than, than profit. Informative, especially from a historical perspective. <coughs> so the, um, I didn't know that so many um, patient groups are paid by the um, But then I wonder, did you find any example that they are actually very scrubby? And then quite, so the, it looks like uh, your story is that in the pharma, once you get the money, 
It's just that they influence you, whatever you think. And you don't think you're thinking, but you're actually influencing. And it's so difficult. I and mean, maybe it's so dangerous to stay on it. So that seems to be like, you know, the picture again. But is it the entire story? So isn't there some group that is very clever? and try to manipulate back, <laughs> or something like that. So it's not just that they're vulnerable, but then is there any example that then you saw like that, then, ah, they might be doing something interesting to buy back in that structure. So, so <coughs> that's taking pharma money, but is also doing good? Yeah. Um, the National Breast Cancer Coalition? Yeah, I think, I think that's a big breast cancer group in the United States that's run by a very savvy group of, of of women, and they do take pharma money. I don't quite understand why they take pharma money, but they do. Um, but they, they do really good work. A, lo a lot of the groups do good work in, in the sense of support and, and so on. Um, but but it, we would still say that some of their views are affected by the money that they take, and some of their silences are affected by the money that they take. You know, and I think there are also examples in the AIDS community. Mm -hmm. I, I, people, I didn't study the AIDS community, but I talked to various people who've been active in it over the years, and they feel that the critical voice within the uh, AIDS community has dissipated, that, that the, the, the more recent activists are not as um, critical or, or politicized as the early, earlier ones were. Um, but. You know, I think there there has been um, this kind of, you know, love hate um, um, culture within the AIDS community. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to mention you might be interested in an article um, um, that uh, that I wrote with some former students called "Direct to Consumer Marketing: um, People with Hemophilia." <laughs> um, hemophilia is really sort of it's a very interesting area where where pharmaceutical company, the, 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 the companies that make the factor that um, people with hemophilia need actually target individuals because a, a person with severe hemophilia can use between $100,000 and a million dollars worth of factor a year. So each person is controlling market share and each person has drug reps assigned to them from every company, possibly at birth, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's and they you know they fund the groups and there have there you know there 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 have been questions raised about whether the slowness of um, of the the national group to respond to the tainted blood crisis when um, in the 1980s when many uh, people with hemophilia um, died from HIV tainted um, blood whether their slowness to respond was because of the pharma money that they're taking, but this is a discussion that's really going on in that community now um, because of the ar of, of this article that we wrote. But anyway, there, there's there's a fair number of examples and things in that article. It's freely a available on PLOS Medicine site. Yes, there's one last question. Oh, um, thank our speakers, but just before I do that, um, I wanted to just bring to everyone's attention, our next uh, seminar in the Health Law Seminar Series, it's on February 10th. It's entitled, Who Has Seen the Asylum? History and Reconciliation in Mental Health? And that will be delivered by Professor Erica Dick at the University of Saskatchewan, who will be visiting us here at Dow. Um, and just an additional mind, reminder that um, if you're interested in Sharon's work in particular and, and potentially acquiring her book, there's, there's those copies uh, that you can secure a discount through up front if you'd like to grab one of those. Uh, but most importantly, I'd just like to thank our speakers again for a really enlightening talk. I think many of us might walk out of here wondering about whether certain conditions that we may have been diagnosed with are actually real or trafficked or uh, alerted to that kind of concern going forward. And that's certainly a, a service for us all. But also sort of laying on the table the very hard work of advocacy and how sort of complex uh, uh, that is. Um, and so thank you again for a really wonderful seminar today. Thank you.